A quarter century after the fall of communism in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, uh, the Kim regime is still in power today, having survived two hereditary transmissions of power and uh, continuing to gain relevance on the international stage uh, only for the wrong reasons. Its development of a long-range ballistic missile program, its development of a nuclear program, and its continuing to commit crimes against humanity in North Korea. Despite cosmetic changes under the regime of young Swiss-educated Kim Jong-un, the four fundamental objectives of the Kim regime have stayed the same. The most important strategic objective of the regime is regime preservation. Secondly, uh, as funny as this might sound, uh, the second strategic objective of the Kim regime is reunification of the Korean Peninsula under the terms of the Kim regime. The third strategic objective is driving a wedge between the United States and the Republic of Korea and breaking up the U.S. ROC alliance. The fourth strategic objective is gaining international relevance through the development of a long-range ballistic missile and nuclear program to the extent where it is capable of mounting a miniaturized nuclear warhead on a long-range ballistic missile capable of reaching the continental United States. Under the regime of Kim Jong-un, the four fundamental building blocks of the Kim regime have remained the same. The party, the Korean Workers' Party, the military, the Korean People's Army, the internal security agencies, State Security Department, Ministry of Public Security, uh, Military Security Command, and fourth, the inner core of the Kim family regime. The regime of Kim Jong-un is not just about a collapse tomorrow. It is unstable because for the past couple of years, actually since they began proceeding with preparations for the second hereditary transmission of power in early 2009, all of these four fundamental building blocks of the regime have been purged. Senior military officers, senior intelligence um, officials, also members of the Korean Workers' Party, in particular those within the administrative department of the Central Committee of the Party, who used to be associates of Chan Song Tech. And this is a first. Now, a member of the core of the Kim family, his uncle, Chang Song Tech was purged with extreme prejudice. Why, why is this regime still in power? What has kept this regime in power? First of all, it is the aggressive, relentless brainwashing of the people of North Korea. North Koreans begin being brainwashed at a precognizant age. Infants in their cradle are taught to point fingers to the portrait of, portraits of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il on the wall. This brainwashing continues throughout the school years. Do some parents realize what's going on? Probably they're afraid to tell their children though because they might speak about it in school and this might uh, get everybody into trouble. Uh, between ages 17 and 27, the overwhelming majority of North Korean men are in the military. That is the age of revolution. Late teens, early 20s, mid 20s. At that age, the overwhelming majority of young men in North Korea are in a military uniform subjected to the same relentless brainwashing. By the time they're out of the military, it's already too late for revolt, for rebellion. Another reason why the Kim regime is still in power is the relentless coercion, control, surveillance and punishment exercised by North Korea's intelligence agencies, internal security agencies. Uh, in 1989, the population of Romania, the one Eastern European country that was most similar to Kim Il-sung's North Korea, was about 23 million people. Romania's notorious secret police, the Securitate, uh, had about 14,000 agents and about half a million informers. North Korea's population today is comparable to Romania in 89. It's almost 25 million people. Uh, the three internal security agencies of North Korea have 270,000 agents. Each and every family in North Korea has to participate in a neighborhood watch system called Iminban. Everyone has to observe everyone and report on everybody else. Due to this relentless surveillance, coercion, control, punishment by the authorities, the degree of social cohesion is very low. It is very difficult for groups of several people to get together and discuss sports. Let's not even think about politics. 
Finally, North Korea continues to exercise aggressive control of the information entering the country from the outside world. Elsewhere, in the Middle East, for example, social media played a role. The overwhelming majority of North Koreans do not have access to the Internet. It's just a privileged few who have this type of access. Uh, there is a cell phone system uh, put in place by an Egyptian company, Arscom Telecom. Uh, they have about 2.5 million subscribers. Why would this repressive regime uh, consider putting in place a cell phone system? Because it's the best way to keep an eye on those who matter the most, those who have the money and the power. It's a way to extract informal taxation from those who can afford these cell phones. And it also looks good whenever foreign travelers go to Pyongyang. They think that this place uh, looks almost like a normal country. Uh, there are factors that are working against the regime. One of them is information. While North Korea continues to be the world's most reclusive regime, more information from the outside world is now entering North Korea through foreign broadcasting, through USBs, DVDs, CD-ROMs, mobile uh, storage devices sold at North Korea's open markets, small informal markets that have developed as a coping mechanism in the aftermath of the great famine that affected North Korea in the 1990s due to some natural disasters but due especially to the regime's policies. Uh, the other factor that works against the regime is, of course, the markets that have developed and also, to a certain extent, um, the, the development of underground Christianity based on um, very reliable sources. There may be as many as 50,000 underground Christians in North Korea in three provinces only, a slow but steady process. The regime has identified these threats to its own existence, and I'm sure you came across reports of people having been executed in seven North Korean cities. These were those who had watched South Korean movies or soap opera. These were those who had been active at the markets, and also Christians. Uh, a UN Commission of Inquiry was established by consensus by the UN Human Rights Council last year, um, and that Commission of Inquiry released its report to the media on the 17th of February. Uh, that commission, for the first time, has clearly made a determination that what we are dealing with in North Korea is crimes against humanity. We used to speak about human rights violations, egregious, abysmal human rights violations. Now we know that we're discussing crimes against humanity in North Korea. Perhaps the, the report's uh, most puzzling um, uh, determination is something that we had known. And that is that North Korea's egregious human rights violations are essential to the very modus operandi of its system. The Kim regime needs human rights violations and crimes against humanity in order to perpetuate itself and survive. After all, this is a regime that was developing a missile, a nuclear program, and purchasing uh, MiG-21 jet fighters from a Central Asian Republic while millions were starving to death in the 1990s. This is a regime that today in the year 2014 continues to run a political prison camp system where at least 120,000 people are imprisoned, subjected to relentless forced labor, induced malnutrition, torture, executions, uh, these are oftentimes three generations of the same family based on a system of guilt by association called Yonja Jae. It's a system of, uh, of feudal extraction and feudal inspiration. This is a country that still continues to classify its citizens based on their degree of loyalty to the regime pursuant to a system called Songbun, a system of social discrimination. The people of North Korea are classified into core class, wavering class, and hostile class. The names are truly, truly frightening. Those perceived wrongdoers, wrong thinkers, those perceived as having engaged in wrong associations or having been in the wrong place at the wrong time, are taken away in the middle of the night and imprisoned in North Korea's political prison camps. One story that we hear from each and every one of those who managed to escape is that they didn't know why they were there. For years and years in a row, they had no idea why they had been imprisoned in these camps. We know more now. How do we know more? We have satellite imagery that we cross-check 
with defector testimony. Many of these defectors um, were former political prisoners. Some of them managed to escape. One of them is, of course, Shin Dong-hyuk, the hero of escape from Camp 14, a young man born and raised in the gulag for the first 23 years of his life who managed to escape, survive, and tell his story. Um, there are others, there are even former political prison camp guards who have come out to tell their story. Uh, we have this evidence from defectors, we have the satellite imagery, we have irrefutable evidence that these crimes against humanity have been perpetrated within North Korea's political prison camp system. The only ones denying that this is happening are the very members of the core of the Kim family regime. Under the leadership of Kim Jong-un, we have identified three main trends pertaining to the human rights situation. First of all, an aggressive purge began in early 2009. As they began preparing for the second hereditary transmission of power, Kim Jong-il had 20 years to prepare, Kim Jong-un barely had two or three years to prepare. Uh, those who fell victim, um, of course, in addition to Chang Song Tech, uh, there was uh, Vice Marshal Ri Yong Ho, one of the, the eight men walking by the hearse of Kim Jong Il. He was expected to be Kim Jong Un's mentor. He was purged in the summer of 2012. Ryu Gyeong, Vice Chair of uh, the, the SSD, the State Security Department, one of the most senior intelligence uh, internal security officials in North Korea, purged and executed. The second trend, an aggressive crackdown on attempted defections. Since the days of the Great Famine in the 1990s, 27,000 former North Koreans have resettled in South Korea. Between 5 and 10,000 have resettled officially in other countries. Much of what we know comes from them. Uh, due to an intensified crackdown on attempted defections, the number of defectors arriving in South Korea declined by 50 percent from 2011 to 2012, from about 2,800 to 1,500. And this trend continued in 2013. There were only about 1,500 North Korean defectors arriving in South Korea. Uh, the third trend has been a restructuring of the political prison camp system. A facility close to the border with China, Camp Number 22, in uh, Heryong, North Hamgyong province, has ceased to function as a political prison camp due to its proximity to the Chinese border. It was simply bad PR. There were some Chinese activities, some Chinese tourists, some Chinese business in the area. Plus, the last thing the Kim regime wants is another Shin Dong Hyok managing to escape, escape across the border into China to tell his or her story to the world. Prisoners were transferred to other facilities. Other facilities have expanded as certified by our own organization and also by others, including Amnesty International. Uh, what we have found at Camp 22 is very troubling. Between 20 and 23,000 inmates disappeared in the process. We don't know what happened to them, although sources on the ground contacted on smuggled Chinese cell phones indicate they, that they starved to death. Why is it important to see North Korea from a, a human rights angle? Uh, because first and foremost, this enables us to understand the nature of the threat we are dealing with, the very nature of the Kim regime. It is also important because we share a lot of things with our staunch friends, allies, and partners, such as the Republic of Korea, South Korea, but of course, economies go up and down, and alliances have to be about much more than just economies and trade and economic exchanges. They have to be about sharing fundamental values. And human rights must be part of that core values that we share with our allies and partners. After all, that is the reason why the North Koreans have been unable to drive a wedge between the United States and South Korea or the United States and Japan, just because we share those very values. Uh, finally, if there is one lesson that we have learned in uh, the Middle East, for the past few years, that is that despots who egregiously violate the human rights of their own citizens, especially if they're armed with weapons of mass destruction, end up being significant regional threats, significant threats to international peace and security. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Greg, thank you. Um, I just have one quick question, then we'll open it up. Um, that The UN report had some pretty gruesome details in it as to the situation in North Korea. And as someone who is not a North Korea expert, my question is, 
Has the human rights situation in North Korea gotten worse, even by North Korean standards, under new leadership in North Korea, or is it just a matter of of more information coming out about the the situation as it already has been for some time? Based on those three trends that I uh, that I mentioned in my presentation, the situation under Kim Jong Un has deteriorated. Uh, we probably have had a little bit less information that we had during the years preceding Kim Jong-un because they have cracked down not only on attempted defections but they have cracked down on those in possession of uh, portable radios those who, who are more prone to listening to foreign broadcasting and they have aggressively and desperately tried to further isolate North Korea from the outside world the, the reason behind that is obvious once again, since the system is likely, it's not likely to collapse tomorrow night. Uh, nevertheless, Kim Jong-un needs more time to establish his own power base. He is not done with that process. He also needs more time to finalize the purging of those associates of Chang song Tech and others. And that is most likely the reason why we're seeing this charm offensive going on uh, along inter-Korean relations. Thank you. Other questions for Greg? Erin. Um, regarding North Korea, can you um, uh, expand on the China connection and also uh, the, um, the general feeling among the South Korean population? China helped establish and maintain the Kim regime for more than 60 years. China is an aspiring superpower that will not give up its ally, satellite state, bargaining leverage, buffer zone. Um, China could be much more helpful, in particular in terms of protecting North Korean political refugees. China refuses to grant North Korean political refugees access to the process leading to acquiring political refugee status. China continues to claim that they are illegal economic migrants. It forcibly repatriates them. In cases where uh, North Korean intelligence agencies during the inter interrogation process determine that they have come across Christian missionaries or South Koreans in particular, they're tortured, they're beaten, they're killed, and they're sent to political prison camps. Um, unspeakable violence um, has been conducted against, especially against women, women who became pregnant with Chinese men along the road of defection if they were repatriated. Uh, we have had very credible and numerous reports of forced abortions and, uh, and even of infanticide. Uh, why are these North Koreans political refugees? We don't even need to, to argue that, as we know, the cause of North Korea's economic ruin is not economic, it's political, it's the regime's adamant refusal to open up, to reform, to change the situation in that country. But these refugees have crossed an international border, and because they face grave danger upon their return to their home country, to North Korea, pursuant to the 1951 UN Convention for the Protection of Refugees, they should qualify as refugees sur place, as refugees on site, and be granted, automatically be granted access to the process leading to acquiring political refugee status. China is a party to the convention. It refuses to abide by the terms of the convention, instead claiming a bilateral extradition treaty put in place between North Korea and China. During the days of the Chinese uh, Cultural Revolution, when things were so bad in China, the Chinese people were running away to North Korea. Uh, the, the South Korean view on this, um, it is, I think, difficult for South Korean nationals to wake up every morning worrying about North Korea. I think that somehow subconsciously, ordinary South Koreans refuse to think too much about North Korea. Now, certainly that is because everyone is aware of, um, of the, the ever-present pre danger of North Korea and the sheer terror of the proximity and mass of the North Korean military right there, right across the border. Um, I, I think there, that there is more interest in the North Korean human rights situation in North Korea. Um, for a variety of reasons, interest is not as high as it should be. One of the reasons is that groups uh, dealing with North Korean human rights, such as our own group, need assistance, they need funding. That assistance can, could come 
from private sources, unfortunately private sector organizations that were seen or perceived as donating to what was seen as conservative causes during those 10 years of sunshine policy, they were penalized at the time and having gone through that experience once, they're less willing, even now with a different administration in the Blue House, to donate it to this cause that in South Korea is still seen as a conservative cause. It shouldn't be seen as political. Uh, the South Korean parliament is not managing to pass the, the North Korea Human Rights Act. This is a highly divisive issue. Um, the, the Senate Party, the conservatives, are in favor of a Human Rights Act. The opposition, the progressives, uh, are in favor of more focus on more or less unconditional humanitarian assistance. So we, we're not seeing any agreement there. If that legislation were passed, maybe more support uh, could become available for human rights groups uh, dealing with North Korea. Other questions? Mori. What do you make of the uh, recent meetings they had in a North Korean, quote, resort, unquote, <laughs> for reunification of people from South and North Korea? What was that about? Um, meetings of families separated by the 38th parallel have happened before. And the North Koreans once again agreed uh, to allow uh, separated families from North Korea to meet with their South Korean relatives. This is part of a charm offensive uh, by the North Koreans, most likely meant to buy them more time to consolidate the regime and to proceed with further purges. Um, the South Korean approach to, uh, to these talks has been very interesting. The North Koreans have always insisted that South Korea and the United States should put an end to joint military exercises. Whenever the North Koreans uh, speak of the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, that is code for the cessation of joint U.S. ROC exercises and eventually the complete withdrawal of the U.S. military presence there. They agreed to leave this issue off the table. Then the, the U.N. Commission of Inquiry uh, came up with this report and the North Koreans reminded the South Koreans that they had agreed to refrain from quote-unquote slander. The South Korean side told them this is not slander. A discussion of human rights is a matter of abiding by internationally accepted standard. This issue is off the table. So this is part of uh, the South Korean presidents of President Park Geun-hye's approach based on trust politique. The idea being that trust needs to be built between the two Koreas. The problem with that is that North Korea is not a society based on trust internally. It's a society based on terror and oppression. And externally, they have zero credibility. They joined the MPT in 1985, pulled out of the MPT in 93, joined the, the, uh, the Geneva Agreed Framework in 94, pulled out, six-party talks, pulled out again. As recently as two years ago, we had the, the Leap Day Agreement when Ambassador Glenn Davis, uh, Special Envoy for North Korea Policy, shook hands with the uh, first uh, Foreign Vice Minister Kim Kae won They pledged to place a moratorium on uh, missile testing and nuclear testing. Two and a half weeks later, they, they rescinded their promise. So let, let's see what the North Koreans do to, to gain the trust that's needed along inter-Korean relations. But frankly, I have to say that I'm very skeptical. And I, I think that experts expect another North Korean provocation somewhere down the line. Actually, uh, yesterday they, they launched uh, four um, short-range missiles um, on, on the East Coast. Uh, this is these meetings are ongoing. Other questions? Yes, Wayne in the back. I was uh, privileged to visit South Korea, I think 1991, with a group from the ASEAN Foundation, and we visited the a, what is called, I remember, a Unification Institute. And I don't know if that's still, uh, I don't know if that institute is still in operation there. But uh, they were making plans for the hopeful, and I, uh, hopeful reunification of the peninsula. And uh, they told us at the time, uh, don't, the dynamics of reunification for the peninsula would be different than the dynamics of the uh, reunification of West and East Germany, and uh, what is that? Is, is that institute still in operation? And if so, uh, what are what is it doing to you know? Hopefully, one day, will there be freedom in the North to 
bring about the successful integration of both the South and the North. The Korea Institute for National Unification, KINU, is still there. They're still working on their research to prepare for the reunification of the two Koreas. Uh, for many years, South Korean scholars obsessed with the precedent of German reunification, and that is possibly why they have also obsessed over the perceived cost of reunification. There are tremendous benefits uh, to be had out of reunification. Uh, and also there are some very tough issues that, uh, that South Korean think tanks are beginning to tackle. For example, there is the very tough issue of uh, transitional justice. How are we going to deal? Some, some frightening, simple but frightening questions. What happens to the North Korean military? Are the two uh, commands joined? Uh, what happens with those North Korean officials? Based on the Eastern European precedent, we would certainly need to prosecute uh, in some cases. Unfortunately, this was not done in Eastern Europe. We've never really seen a, uh, a, a large-scale condemnation of communism, any Nuremberg-style trials there. Um, if North Korean officials have been involved in crimes against humanity, they should be prosecuted by international or domestic tribunals. Responsibility based on the Nuremberg principles should go all the way down the chain of command. In other cases, lustration may be possible, some type of truth and reconciliation, but lustration would also be very important. Make sure that those North Korean officials do not play a role in a reunified Korea for a while, at least 10, 15, 20 years, whatever Koreans decide. Thank you, sir. Fred. I, I sympathize with that position, but I, I really disagree with it. And I think as long as the standard is that we're going to prosecute every North Korean official, the regime is never going to give up. Wouldn't a better model be the reconciliation agreement attempted in South Africa? I mean, it's, it sounds sort of wild, but if, if, the Kim Jong, if, the, if the Kim regime thinks they're all going to be executed, they have no incentive to give up power. I think that is a great point. And one problem in North Korea is that North Korean, high-ranking North Korean officials could have learned from the precedent of their Eastern European and Soviet peers, who after all ended up being the great winners of the post-communist transition. If one looks at the billionaires, many of the billionaires of today, they had the, the capital, the know-how, the connections that enabled them to be successful. They knew how to tweak the system. Why haven't the North Koreans learned this lesson? That is probably because the elites of North Korea realize that in a post-Kim regime scenario, unlike their Eastern European peers, they're expendables. They're not indispensable because there is a clear alternative that is the Republic of Korea, South Korea, just south of the 38th parallel, and, and they, re, they realize that they will not be needed, and most likely their fate will be to, to go away together with the Kims and with their regime. 